to Countdown to Destruction. Uh, this is episode four. This is our Leftovers podcast. Uh, each episode we break down two more episodes of the now very much over um, HBO show, The Leftovers, which is beloved by my co-host, Ben Phillips. Ben, how are you this evening? I'm good. It's not as hot as last time, so you might not need no, to right. like cut cut recording as short as we did last time. <laughs> yeah, we did kind of motor through that one. Sorry if that's not pleasant listening, but yeah, uh, we're really dating this because the heat wave is probably going to be over by the time these air. Because our first episode is dropping like two days from when we're recording this one. So, uh. woo. What a time. What a time to be alive. Uh, as I watch these episodes of The Leftovers for the very first time, and Ben, of course, not for the first time, we try and offer no spoilers beyond the episodes we're talking about. The only spoilers I've dropped so far are just things I legitimately forgot happened. <laughs> and I probably will have edited them out by the time we uh, we get to them. So, When we last spoke to you all, I had begun to enjoy this show a lot more, and spoilers for the next hour, maybe. I continue to enjoy this show now, so we're in it. I was not high on the first four episodes. Like, obviously, there's that one standout one, but I was kind of like, yeah, this is going to be rough viewing if it continues like this. But no, super into it now. Kind of hitting me from all the angles I care about in that, like, there is some more, like, mysterious plot creeping in as well as the good character stuff. And so. Yeah, like, we, we, we've, we're now three kind of standard episodes of the show that feel good and have, like, points. Yeah. Uh, I mean, both both of the episodes we watch now kind of like they focus back on a central point. You've got like the first episode is obviously very much focused on what's happening with Kevin Senior, and the second episode is kind of focused on Kevin uh, Junior. <laughs> Kevin, Ju- Kevin Junior in the cabin. Yeah. All right, let's do it to it. So, at Solace for Tired Feet, at August tenth, twenty fourteen, directed by Mimi Leader, who did Gladys. You said she becomes the sort of go-to director for this show. Yeah, she does one more episode this season, so mm. okay. so th- three episodes mean she pips yeah. your boy, Peter Berg. <laughs> Written by your boy, Damon Lindelof, and uh, Jacqueline Hoyt, who last teamed up to do uh, that Matt episode. Is it Two Boats and a Helicopter, that one called? It is Two Boats and a Helicopter. Why is it called you that? Say, you say, you, I don't know. You, you say this like... <laughs> You say this like you're surprised that David Lindelof has written the episode. I just meant, you know, this is the exact. This is the team that brought us the best episode so far. So, so cool. it is. It uh, is the team and the director that you know brought us not the best episode, but a pretty good one. So, yes. this is a good trio of people I feel to play with. Yes. So, as usual, I may have to jump around for the sake of coherent conversation. But the GR <laughs> still, <laughs> still going. They're tearing down posters of Gladys that are marked "Save Them." And in the midst of this, Laurie spots Jill across the street. Jill copes with making eye contact with her mother by going into the woods and getting in a fridge for a really long time. (laughs) This show. It's like a thing that these sexy local teens that are into choking each other like to do. Like they decided they decided choke sex is basic, so they decided to up it and get in a fridge until they suffocate. See, I like I like the idea of the fridge because it seems like the kind of stupid thing you would do as a teenager, which yeah. is like you make up a stupid horror story where it's like, "Ooh, this kid disappeared from inside the fridge." It's like, well, no shit, lots of people disappeared. Yeah, I do like this concept that someone vanished inside the fridge, and now the fridge is like a sacred item. So yes, they get in this fridge and they try and stay in for as long as they can, and they write who's done what times and stuff, and because Jill is our our angsty little princess. She's like, I can break the record. And in she gets. And she does manage it. But then the fucking handle breaks off when they're trying to get her out. And it wouldn't have shocked me if Jill had died in this moment as an opener <laughs> for an episode. And she is rescued by Kevin Senior, who is very much not in his uh, mental health care facility anymore. And is kind of like... Don't tell your father. And off he walks. They're growing on me, these dumb fucks. These these (laughs) stupid, stupid, sexy teens who, like, choke play. I I don't know. Like, the twins, I don't think, are very good actors. Jill pisses me off. Amy is pure joy. But (laughs) somehow it's all getting through to me. And I kind of like these weird customs they do. They just love playing with their own mortality. You know? I know. (laughs) Like, yeah, it's not not the best developed area of the show but it's like it's the one that this season they seem to be like delving into like the actual psychological ramifications of what teenagers would do yeah because these these feel like just kind of like this is what teens do in a normal world what would they do 
in a world where everything's kind of fucked up. And I do think that in some ways they are logical progressions. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I just want to be there for the first time someone pitched the choke orgy, you know, like, hey guys, what if? <laughs> so, what? So, so I've made an app, which is like... <laughs> That's the, the other pitch. part of this that I didn't even consider. Someone's facilitated a legitimate like, technology to make all this, oh, whatever. Th- also, pe- was it on iPhone? Like, someone has literally made an app that says choke and burn. Yeah, is this available for sale? Are kids doing this all across the country? Like, what's happening? Anyway, Kevin and Nora have been on four dates since we last saw them. Uh, they head on over to her place to bone down. However, the GR are camped outside, most notably Meg. And Kevin's all like, you know, fuck off. <laughs> Nora, because she is just the greatest. She hasn't got time for that shit. She literally just gets a hose and sprays them down, and off they go. These two are just so fucking adorable together. I just want the show to just be them having a good time, you know? I don't want anything to destroy their love. I think the line, I don't know how to talk to you yet, is really great. Like, that's such a... It's it's almost too real that I don't think anyone would actually say it, but it just it smacks off being a realistic thing a person would say. It's like a perfect expression. Um, yeah, I don't know how to talk to you yet. Yeah, um, like Damon Lindelof said, like when they shut down production, a big reason they shut down production was because they realised how much chemistry Justin Theroux and Carrie Coon had, mm. and they were like, well, we need to pivot into this more, yes. because... <laughs> We've got two actors that are really good, and they're really good with each other, yeah. and we're depriving the audience if we don't give yeah. them more screen time together. And I think like that's a big part of why these two episodes also work, is that we get... The show is more confident with the people who it pairs together. It has, it has the issue of the kind of the teams are problematic, but they keep on pairing people with interesting people. Justin Through gets to be really good with Carrie Coon, and he gets to be good with a different actress in the next episode, yeah. and... It's it's nice to see them doing that. And also, you know, you, you see so many shows and, like, it's obvious who they are, like, pushing together. And as an audience, you just passively are like, yeah, okay. And best case scenario, you're like, yeah, I root for them. And this definitely falls into that category where if you, don't, if you sit and watch this and don't want these two kids to kiss each other on the face, then what's wrong with you? Nora sort of... I was like, yeah, you go, Nora, because she brought up how the GR's tactics are kind of questionable as i keep saying every episode <laughs> hoping they'll disprove me that being said they did successfully cop block them because kevin does head home uh not so yeah i i've now because i watched the episode a couple of days ago i've forgotten exactly what she critiques about what they're doing but uh, she's like you know what they're trying to do like stalk us into joining them or something i don't know but yeah i did enjoy that so yeah kevin heads home uh where he finds jill who tells him that kevin senior is loose. So Kevin, of course, begins a manhunt for his own father. He questions the mayor, who we saw, you know, when Kevin visited his father in the home, that they they clearly close or, you know, go back a ways or whatever. I even even thought they kissed on the mouth, but they didn't. (laughs) We also find out that Kevin's dad burnt down a light. Yes, I was getting to that. Uh, Yeah, we find out from this that, yeah, the thing that... I don't know if it's the thing that got him sectioned, but like, yes, he burned down a library. I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a wild stab and assume that him getting sectioned might have something <laughs> to do with him talking to people who aren't there. Well, there is that, but you know, it's <laughs> normally an incident that draws major. I don't know. Yeah, and the mayor says she hasn't seen Kevin Senior for a month uh, because of his increased level of rambling. Yeah, so she's gotten sick of it. So. I guess without that that comfort of a person visiting, he'd had enough, and off he went on his travels. While Kevin is sort of waiting to hear something, he puts his radio down, and we hear a single word come over the radio, and I was like, I missed it the first time, and I rewound, and I had subtitles on. And it was Cairo, or Cairo as we would say, but, and I was like, ah, what does that mean? Turns out that's the name of the next episode, so I would find out what it meant a lot sooner than, than I could have possibly hoped. So Kevin has what we assume... At first, is another one of his lovely dreams, which are all symbolic and stuff. Uh, where he opens his door and Dean is there. He has trapped a dog in a mailbox. Uh, Kevin refuses to shoot it. And he looks in the back of Dean's truck and he sees bodies of the GR, including Laurie. So that's your immediate... Oh, he's dreaming then. But then he wakes up on his bedroom floor with a bandaged hand and the dog from his dream is tied up out back. And he has no fucking clue how either of those things happened. Like, Amy is quizzing him about the event from last night, and he has no idea. And 
yeah, it kind of seems like these are not so much, and we'll see even more of it in the next episode, but, like, maybe these aren't dreams so much as, like, I don't know, you kind of get the, the idea he's getting visions in his real sort of day-to-day life, and then he's also having memory problems, so maybe none of these have been dreams, maybe these have all been real things that happened. Although he did have that one with Amy and the fire. You know what, never mind that one. Uh, just if, you know, There's clearly more going on here than just he has weird dreams, because some portion of that legit happened, and he now has a dog in his back garden. Kevin is not healthy. He's not a healthy man. His father's right. He's he's hearing things. Do you know if the show that Amy was watching is real or is this that is one? that is Perfect Strangers? Perfect Strangers. Oh, is it the same one as, as Kevin Senior was watching? Yes, it is. Okay, so I'm, I'm glad I I'm, I'm looking out for these things. You are. That is Perfect Strangers. I was gonna I was gonna say yeah, she is watching the the show. It is a fun little recurring gag throughout the series that <laughs> seemingly Perfect Strangers, this kind of mildly obscure 80s sitcom, has had a massive resurgence because the entire cast disappeared. <laughs> Do you want to say your poignant thing about the GR in the back of the truck? Get it? Because they're, they're the same as the dogs. You know, oh they, yeah, I did. <laughs> they yeah, went they rabid are. after the event and they need to be put down. <laughs> that was the similarity I drew. I'm sure, I'm sure you would watch a show where the Guilty Remnant got mowed down more than you watch a show where dogs got mowed down though. Well, of course I would. <laughs> You show me someone on the planet who wouldn't. I'll show you a fucking psychopath. Yeah, so Kevin Senior shows up at the house uh, after first breaking into... I don't know if it's, if it's the same library rebuilt or a different library, but he wrecks up this library, demands $200 for his son, and beats the shit out of one of Kevin's officers. And then when he tells Jill he stumbled across her by coincidence, she doesn't believe him. Uh, she calls Kevin immediately, who comes to escort him back to the home. But uh, Kevin Senior escapes using a GR protest. So Kevin Senior is a fucking badass. Scott Glenn, it's weird seeing a man that has the telltale signs of being almost elderly, but then is also weirdly in shape, and there's some like youthful exuberance about his eyes. And so it, it's weird. I don't, you I say don't... you say almost elderly. Well, Man's in his seventies. Jesus Christ! <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, he'd kick all our asses. It's it's a weird thing where I'm like, are you in your late fifties? Are you in your early eight? What what are you? Yeah, he was born in 1941. Wow. Is he in like some sort of competition with J.K. Simmons as to who can be weirdly buff at an advanced age? Yeah. I guess J.K. Simmons is a bit younger than him, though. Anyway, yeah, uh, I like that he's very candid with Jill about the voices. Like, he tosses her the the line about, you know, it's a coincidence. She doesn't believe him. And then when she asks him about, can you hear them right now? He's like, yeah. And so, you know what? On a show where Kevin is kind of frequently keeping things from her that there's really no reason he needs to, I kind of appreciate that Kevin Senior is just up front and is like, yeah, they say you look like Snow White. I was like, well, it doesn't make you sound less insane, but it is nice that you at least are forthright with it. I think it's interesting, because obviously, like, I, d- I don't think that what Kevin Sr. and Kevin Jr. are dealing with are, like, the same. No. Um, although, although Kevin Sr. does seem to intimate that, you know, this is how it starts. <laughs> yeah, but it is it is interesting that, like, Kevin Sr. is obviously dealing with it for longer, and he's a lot more at the point where it's just like, I think this is real, and I'm going to address it in such a manner where, and nonchalance, the worst thing you can do in this situation to like not be believed is to make a big song and dance of it. If you treat it as almost a boring fact of life, you're far more likely to be taken seriously. Yeah. Kevin Jr., a bit of an idiot. <laughs> like when they're, when they're driving and he just says, stop, and then he does. And then Kevin Sr. just gets out and runs into the middle of a GR parade. Yeah, but and... if they hadn't stopped, they'd run into the GR. I thought he was... Stopping because he saw an opportunity, not like trying to stop him from hitting anyone. He saw an opportunity, but he also told him to stop because they were going quite fast and were going to hit. Kevin Senior, get you a man who can do both. (laughs) (laughs) He's a responsible citizen and he's also a dirty, rotten crim on the run. Yes, so later on, Kevin is feeding the dog. He discovers the buried money. Remember this from Matt's episode. Um, And he puts two and two together, makes the connection between Matt and Kevin Senior calls Matt, who reluctantly arranges a meeting, and we get this juicy little scene uh, between the two Kevins in a diner, or a, a, yeah, I guess a diner. Kevin Senior produces a copy of National Geographic from May 1972, and he's like, this is your purpose kind of thing. And this is clearly what he was looking for at the library, what he needed the money to go and and buy, because I guess, you know, it's so old that it's worth money or whatever. And he says to Kevin, the lucky ones get to stay sane, but the two of them are needed for a higher purpose. 
Kevin rejects him because of course he does. He he loves to deny the advancing plot of this show and wants to live mm-hmm. his quiet little life. Kevin Senior flips the fuck out, slaps Kevin, yells at everyone, says, you know, just stay asleep, like don't even wake up, whatever. And uh, Kevin takes him into custody. So yeah, this was this was very much playing into the what I want. I want some more teases of the grander mystery and stuff. And my first read when, you know, you see that Kevin Senior hears voices was Oh, I guess he thinks he can talk to the departed or something like that. Now, when he's saying all this stuff about purpose and knowing that while they're not confirming it was the rapture, they're certainly putting that as a possible option on the table. It now kind of seems like maybe Kevin hears angels and he feels that, sorry, Kevin Senior feels he can like talk to angels and that like he and his son are supposed to be helping get the world ready for the war between Jesus and the Antichrist that happens in the book of Revelation. I don't know. Everything is on the fucking table I mean, because there is there is a sh- pregnant person in this episode. There is. I you can very clearly draw a line between Wayne and Wayne's baby and, and you know, this religious allegory and all that, but very, very intriguing conversation between the two Kevins and I desperately want more Scott Glenn. You will get more Scott Glenn this season. I guess, I guess there's not really much you can add about that conversation because, I mean, I guess heavy spoils, but yeah, no, I, I thought it was just I, really well what played. I can, <laughs> what I can do, yeah, I mean, like, Scott Bell is terrific in that scene. Like, he he does the great t- tight wire trip between being sane and being insane. Mm-hmm. Just the switch flips where he talks to people and he comes back in and, like, kind of, like, talks with this great purpose. And, yeah. like, the, he is far better in this show than he was ever in either Daredevil or in The Defenders. Yeah, he fucking pisses me off as stick. Like, you you had this attachment to him, and I was like, what are you talking about? He kind of sucks a bit, and then now I get it. Like, he's great in this, and you're just happy to see him getting more work. (laughs) I love that he immediately deduced that they were surrounded. He's like, I hired that fat fuck. Like, just fucking uncuff me, you idiot. But I I really like this idea that Kevin Senior is still the superior police officer to Kevin (laughs) Jr., you know? Well, yeah, yeah. because Kevin... Kevin Jr. just got given the job because his dad did it, really. I know, but, like, you know, you're presented with this handsome, in-shape dude who kind of seems like he's a bit sharper than most of the people around him. And it's like, next to his dad, he's just a fucking idiot. (laughs) It's like his dad is 17 and could still kick his ass, probably. (laughs) So, yeah, I'm into that. I'm also into Kevin telling Matt to fuck off. Like, (laughs) I think one of my recurring favourite gags in this show is when Matt attempts to give people religion and they're just like, go fuck yourself. (laughs) Like, there is no place for you in this world anymore. Maybe there is a massive place for you and we don't realise it. Yeah, yeah. Matt, Matt is undersung. Like, whenever he shows up, he does his little, like, Bible verse. And everyone's just like, ah, why are you bothering? <laughs> yeah, like Kevin Jr., like in the previous episode, he's like, what the fuck does that even mean? Like, just speak plainly, you fool. And yeah. uh, then he's just straight up like, hey, fuck off this time. I love the bit where Kevin takes that severely underpaid carer for his wife, mm. borrows her phone, and then gets so pissed off he just smashes it on the floor. Oh, yeah, he does do that. <laughs> he does. And she's just like, what the fuck are you doing? Kevin is so losing his job if you look at the events of this episode, of these yeah. episodes. <laughs> but, hey. Right. But what I can do is what? divulge some of the stuff that is in the National Ge- Geographic May 1972 issue. That is not related to the plot, but just is in that issue. But is is teased in this episode, but it's not related to the plot. I mean, the front cover looks like a bear standing up, doesn't it? It does, right. right. The title of the episode, Souls for Tired Feet, is actually a um, picture... Right, a caption from inside the issue. Nice. So that is that is one that, that we now know where the title came from. Right. There is an article in the National Graphic May 1972 issue called "The Spider That Lives Underwater," which is one of the things that Christine says in her kind of like pregnant coma state. Oh right. <laughs> says there's spiders underwater. I try and pay as little attention to Christine as physically <laughs> possible. So. I'll take your word on that one. So, and then that is that is it for this episode. But there are a few more for next episode that okay. I can kind of like sprinkle throughout. I like it. This is a regular feature. Meanwhile, in National Geographic, nineteen seventy-two. So, on the adrenaline high of like arresting his father and telling a priest to fuck off, Kevin heads over to Nora's house, and boy, do they bang! <laughs> uh, it's really beautiful, and it's not it's not like pretty sex. It's kind of rough sex, but it's just really well shot, and it's like look at these two actors go, you know. <laughs> Like, it's it's kind of real. Yeah, it is. 
it's not too cute, it's not too, like, porny, it's, like... And it's also not comically, like, over in 30 seconds or anything, like most movies, but hey. Yeah, it's over in 30 seconds and the woman comes away being like, oh, that was the most satisfying thing that ever happened. <laughs> I definitely had an orgasm in less than one minute. Definitely, definitely. So he returns home the next day all high on I Just Bang Nora, which, who can blame him? I mean, that's, that's the high we can all only hope to chase. He finds... The very Nat Geo issue that Kevin Senior tore up in the diner before. And you, know, you have to consider like the number of hallucinations or weird dreams Kevin Jr. has been having lately. So in a kind of, you know, The Mask or Click or... I'm struggling to think of other examples. But, you know, where someone like throws an object away and it's right back in front of them. That trope. He has to suspect that's what's happening. <laughs> but, no, Jill ordered it for Kevin Senior because he dropped a piece of paper that had the details about it written down. I was like, eh. Well, there you go. you got to read it now. You fuck. It's right there in front of you. You've had a night to sleep off your rage. Like, I, I hope he sits down and reads it. Yeah, we, we don't find anything out from that issue yet. Uh, also, in the midst of this, it's not really worth having its own like section, but Meg goes and tells Laurie about uh, Kevin and Nora. And uh, Laurie claims she doesn't care. In in writing, she claims she doesn't care. And then it's like, Meg, you dirty rotten snitch. Like, fuck off. Let people be happy. Meanwhile, She's a living reminder, Matt. She's a living reminder. Meanwhile, in Gary, Indiana, uh, home of the Jacksons, our resident dumbasses, Tom and Christine, inform us it's been two months since they heard from Holy Wayne. And then right on cue, <laughs> a mostly naked, even more delirious than usual Wayne calls Tom... Well, Christine is, like, very clearly not well, and Tom is out trying to get medication for her. And he asks Tom to return half the money he gave him uh, through a drop. And, like, Wayne initially doesn't know who Tom is when he picks up the phone. And he's like, oh, yeah. And then, like, he's completely... Which one are you? (laughs) Exactly. Well, we find out what all that means very shortly, but... He's completely undeterred by the news that Christine is sick as well, so... There's that. I also think it's interesting that, like, he hasn't spoken to them in two months, but he knows where they are because he's like, oh, go to this street location and leave the money. And it's like, so they're not just on a constant run. They're going to places and waiting for an instruction on where to go next, I guess. Or, like... Or or they're telling him when they get to a place. Sure. Even if he's not returning, they're... Like, are they texting him? Yeah. I, I, it's, okay. it's, like, it's like Peter and... Um... Happy in, in Spider-Man: Homecoming. Right, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, like Peter's just constantly texting. Are going, you like, likening Yo. these two fuckwits to Peter Parker? Yes. Okay. Look, Matt, Matt, Chris Zilka is literally Flash Thompson. <laughs> well, brought back around. Yes. So Tom follows the guy who picks up the money he leaves. Follows him, and he finds that this man is also looking after a heavily pregnant underage Asian girl wearing a blue top, and. <laughs> Yeah, I like I like that it goes to that level of detail. They're wearing the same colour of clothing. And Tom says the phrase, I have one too. And it's like, <laughs> what the fucking fuck? This cult is super fucked up. Everyone involved is the worst human in the world. It's like a 900-way tie for worst character. When this other pregnant lady learns of Christine... She begins, she opens fire and even hits Tom with a bullet. And she says, I think she says, he said it would be mine. She calls Wayne the bridge. And it's all like, ah, what's, what's, all, what's all happening here then? Like, Wayne's got his little empire of potential antichrists, I guess, out there. Some weirdness happening. I don't know why they have to be Asian and underage. Maybe that's just his kink and he's I also he on a mission. Looked- he literally just has a fetish. Okay, so he's got a mission, and also, if I have to do this, I'm going to do it in a way I enjoy, and I like me some underage Asian girls. See, I know I know you have a big issue with the dog thing. Yes. But I genuinely think Holy Wayne is, like, the worst person. Probably, yeah. Because I get, I get what Dean but is But this doing. is almost comical, you know? Like, it's like cult leader has impregnated a bunch of underage Asian women and is sending them off in pairs with like rugged sort of burnout looking white dudes to protect and is struggling to keep track of them all because he's got so many that's a farcical thing just straight up gunning down dogs is fucking gross yeah but like I get why Dean is doing that (laughs) yeah fine but I don't need to like like I don't sympathise, but I no. understand what his reasoning is. Look, Holy if... Wayne is literally just like, oh, I want to protect the children. 
Look, if we're in a character off between who's a worse person between Dean the dog murderer and Holy <laughs> Wayne the cult leading fucking pedophile, there are no winners or losers in that outcome. <laughs> anyway, Wayne calls again. Tom smashes the phone. Possibly the first thing he's done so far that I even remotely agree with. I guess he fought I, off. I, a wo- I, I guess he fought off a man who was attacking a pregnant woman. There is that. I say fought yeah. off. He fought off. Fell really onto. Yes. I do want to say I really like the kind of graffiti on the wall behind them when they when he throws this. What does it say? It's like, it's, it's the it's the picture of like a burnt out girl who looks like she was like in a nuclear blast wherever it is. I think it's just a nice. Metaphor kind of for Tom's si- life, yeah. <laughs> or metaphor for like the rapture or anything like that. It's yes. just, it's one of those kind of nice pieces of set direction that I quite enjoyed. Uh, so Tom gets home, blood all over the floor, Christine missing, follows the trail of blood. She's not dead, as I thought this was going to end up. Uh, she is in a bath, a very, very unclean looking bath, holding a crying newborn baby. We have our I mean, first. You say newborn, it doesn't look particularly newborn. No, it does not. But hey, um, we have our first potential Antichrist, if that's what they're going for. I mean, I assume they're not saying this is the Antichrist, but I assume that's kind of where Wayne believes he is. I don't know. Uh, Overall, I thought this was a great episode. It's probably my favourite, like, on-format one they've done so far. Like, I love Guest, I love uh, Two Boats and a Helicopter, but of the ones that are just, like... Let's move between all the characters and tell a straightforward narrative or whatever. I think this is my favourite one so far. Yeah, I, I I completely agree there. I think it's the show is slowly ramping up to being what it can be. Um, and this is kind of like, you can see a lot of the stuff they've been... I don't even want to say seeding, because I don't think this season's got like a driving narrative force to it at all. Hey, it's purpose. National Geographic. It's coming yeah. soon. But it's <laughs> just, it starts to feel like things are heading to a conclusion of some sort. Well, I mean, Wayne has said it, and the GR are saying it, that they, they feel something is imminent. And, you know, maybe it's the birth of this this small child of, who is a product of crime. We will see. Have you got anything else on this episode that you want to toss out there? Anything technically, music, I don't know? Um, I like the mo- like this. I think this must have been my first time I heard Wolf Alice. Yeah, I... You think it back on it. I mean, obviously I didn't see the show <laughs> until now but yeah I guess it would have been quite early uh, into their sort of I feel a lot of people still don't know who Wolf Alice are so. no, this, is very, this, is, this is very much like people who used to work in a record store yeah. Wolf Alice but, are great everyone Go yeah, yeah they are this was I mean this was before their debut came out so yeah exactly it's definitely one of the early songs Mimi Leader is really fucking good the whole the whole scene of like Jill trapped in the in the fridge feels like the right level of claustrophobic yeah you get the sense it's more of a heat thing than a no oxygen thing but yeah like she, she's good and it's nice to see a show kind of like embracing having actual women direct it Speaking of which, our next episode, Cairo, or Cairo if you're in America, August 17th, 2014, directed by another woman, Michelle McLaren, in I believe her first episode directing for The Left It is her first episode, but you might recognise her from such TV shows as Breaking Bad and The mm. Walking Dead and Game of Thrones. Which episodes of Game of Thrones did she do? Uh, she did some in season, I want to say three and four. Cool. Those were, second, me... those were still good seasons. <laughs> those were still good seasons. Let me, yeah. let me actually look it up. I've got it here. She did The Bear and the Maiden Fair. Nice. That's a Second, very good episode. <laughs> Second Sons, uh, which is the episode immediately afterwards. Oathkeeper and First of His Name. Okay. She also was the first director for Wonder Woman before she dropped out. Oh, okay. That's a shame. I mean, you know, no disrespect to Patty Jenkins, but... Maybe Michelle McLaren's a better director. Who knows? Um, she also directed Ozymandias of Breaking Bad, which is the the finale of Breaking Bad, if you ask me. Is that not one that's super good, but it's like two episodes or three before the end? Yes, it is. Yeah, okay. Yeah. She no. Directed, no, 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 that was Ryan Johnson. She did the one before that one. Oh, okay. Go, Ryan Johnson. Written by... Right, I can't believe I'm saying this. Uh, Curtis Gwynn and Carlito Rodriguez. You heard that right. right. I did not say Damon Lindelof. What? I know. Both of these people in their first episode written for the show. No Lindelof, no Peralta, so... Uh... Yeah, and it, it's weird, because this is... <laughs> if this was a season of Lost, this would be, like, the episode that Damon Lindelof would write. Yeah, it feels a very Damon lindelof episode. Maybe he was too close to it, he couldn't have the writing credit. Like, there's <laughs> literally an episode of Lost called The Brig, which is very similar yeah. in yeah. structure to this, that is written by Damon Lindelof. Yes. Okay, 
So, uh, we begin the episode. Kevin invites Nora over for dinner with Jill and Amy. That's not a lot of plot detail, but we get a lot happening in this scene. Jill quizzing Nora about the gun, and then Nora calling her bluff by letting her look through her bag is really well played by both of them. Like, Jill's being as petulant as possible. Kevin's like, hey, you know, shut the fuck up. And Nora's like, no, no, go for it, go for it rebel young teens <laughs> like i've had kids I, i'm not scared of you i do, i love that she's like i've been hugged by a big black man i don't need the gun anymore oh god i didn't even consider that that's what the implication <laughs> was i just assumed it was having sex with kevin no <laughs> oh no hug. i don't want it to have worked i tremendously hope nora can like stare down jill in a contest of like needlessly bitchy versus overly nice you know like i really hope she wins that battle yeah she like keeps on just giving good advice to kevin like when they go out to the car she's yeah. just like don't don't rise don't, to her bed don't go that's back in and fight with her because that's what she wants yeah that's, yeah. that's great stuff i i want to do like the the meat of this and then we'll come back to like the gr and, and jill that's fine. And stuff um so Kevin, after saying goodnight to Nora, uh, he has one of his dreams, again, uh, his, his lovely dreams that aren't really dreams, uh, of being in the woods with Dean, who has Patty tied up unconscious, uh, <laughs> tied to a chair in a log cabin. Only, it's not a dream, because we see Jill and Amy the next morning find he's not in the house, and that Patty is missing from like a meeting with the GR. So this is very real. Dean informs him of what happened and he doesn't remember. Like, he says that it was all Kevin's idea. Like, he says, like, we were drinking and you were like, hey, let's go do this. And that, like, you used to come to Cairo, New York and and all this stuff. So Dean is adamant that Kevin instigated all of this. Kevin has no memory of it. I'm very intrigued immediately by this premise. <laughs> yeah, like, we get, we get, like, we've been hinted at it quite a lot. The way that Dean spoke to him a few episodes ago was like, oh, we're best buds. We see each other all the time and hang out and stuff like that. And why are you being such an arsehole right now? Yeah, and, like, he turns on him constantly. He's He greets him friendlily, and then he'll suddenly be really hostile to him. And we get a lot more of that here. He's basically, later on, he's like, why don't you go find the guy that, like, you know, brought us here or whatever. And then we also get, like, because obviously, like, last episode, Amy me kind of confronted Kevin about you don't remember our conversation about the dog or anything like that do you yep you don't remember any of that and we get this kind of like a confirmation that he is losing time somehow yes and speaking like, of the dog Dean also says how they made a bet wherein Kevin said he could civilize this dog and if he won Dean would stop shooting dogs and if he loses he gives him a dollar <laughs> so yeah <laughs> very fair that's, stakes that, that's such a it's such a such a like drunk bet to make yeah. <laughs> bet where one side ma- means so much less than the other one yes so like, there you go that dog bit him you know, you know clearly most of what we saw last time was real like obviously he hallucinated the bodies in the back but he said he didn't want to shoot it he got bitten and then he was still like hey we're not doing this though and i bet you i can civilize this dog and that's why it's chained up outside his house so yes he is losing time and he is also hallucinating and he's also potentially having prophetic or symbolic dreams. So yeah, but we also get so. So do you think <laughs> at the end of the last episode, Kevin flushed all his drugs down the toilet? He did. He did. Do you think that because this is the first time he's woken up mid kind of lost time? Do you think those kind of are linked to that now that he's not medicating quite as obsessively? Yeah, it's bringing him out of it or whatever. Yeah, I, I completely forgot to bring that up. Yeah, Kevin Senior confronts him about how much medication he's he has stashed in his house, and uh, you know after getting home from that, he uh, yeah he tosses it all. Doesn't give it to the dog like Kevin Senior wants. No, to the implication yeah clearly is that he was medicating, losing track of of time, but now because he isn't medicating, he's sort of coming out of it in the middle of doing it, as opposed to waking up afterwards and be like, how did I get here? Uh, So we'll have to see where that goes, if he truly has this sort of second personality that is is the high, drunk version of him that wants very different things. So Kevin apologises to Patty, obviously. Um, Sorry you're tied up in the woods with two scary men around you. He apologises. She spits in his face and tells him, yes, with her out loud words, uh, that she is going to report him to the authorities. She is gloating about how he's going to lose his job and lose his daughter. Very, very intense stuff, and out is great, it turns out. She continues to be good when she talks. Not that she's bad when she doesn't, but you get a lot more out of her when she talks, obviously. Amy Brennan is a fantastic actor when she gets to speak, but 
she is doing the more incredible stuff just using her like face and kind of body movements without having her voice whereas Anne Dowd is like anytime she gets to talk you're just like oh she's gonna make a fucking meal of this yeah you fucking listen when she talks (laughs) she also Patty asserts that there's no she asserts there's no background on Dean and we we see this in a different part of the episode that basically she she implies she was doing this before the GR but like she's good at finding out stuff about people and she we see the GR have this giant book which has information about ostensibly everyone in the town. Most notably Nora, we will see a page of later. But yeah, she she asserts that while she's got all this dirt and all these people or just information, there is nothing about Dean. No driver's license, nothing. Uh, and, you know, Kevin previously said, you don't even live here. And yes, this, this strange man. <laughs> What's his deal? I don't know. And I want to find out, especially as... I mean, when he does eventually storm off, he pulls the talking to nobody thing, just like Kevin Sr. So that's an immediate, like, oh, don't go, though, because now I want to know more. I I do want to go back to the scene where you kind of see Patty for the first time with the giant, massive binder um, full of names, because they kind of, like, the first scene of the episode is Kevin getting ready for Nora to come over for dinner, and it's being intercut with Patty getting clothes and putting them on the floor. Yeah, I didn't quite know how to explain what she's doing, so I sort of left it out a tiny bit but yeah she she's sort of laying out these very choice it's all very deliberate like these these outfits being laid out on the floor i'm guessing she's using her book and like we'll get to this but yeah, <laughs> yeah. but it, it's just it's just a really well shot scene yeah. that kind of like contrasts the two of them together and makes it like it, it part of what this episode does so well is they kind of bring kevin and patty together and they're two characters who've kind of have had scenes mm-hmm. throughout the season they are um, really good together, like, even before... I mean, the killer one is this one, but... Yeah, even before this, when it's just her, like, glaring at him silently, or, like, when he's trying to honestly connect with her and she's having none of it or whatever, like, they, they have a really good chemistry. Justin through has got really good chemistry with, like, most of the female cast of this show. It's... <laughs> <laughs> Shocking. Dean and Kevin argue... Dean claims Kevin wants to hurt her, like, wants to kill her, all this sort of stuff, and he, you know, he tells him, you know, why don't you go be that person again and when he does go wandering in the woods what does he find but his missing shirts hanging from a bunch of nearby trees he seems very much like he's losing his mind <laughs> like i mean i yeah it, as i said when this whole debacle with the dry cleaners where they're like we don't have your shirts and then he goes back later and he ends up walking away with eight plain white shirts i said it very much felt like He's giving him any shirts because he's scared. And this is 100% the confirmation because these ones have fucking Sheriff Department stuff on them. <laughs> yeah, they're just they're just ceremonially arranged in this forest. It's all very, very strange. Yeah, they're all hanging on different trees yeah. in like a circle. And in the middle of this circle, there's a load of boots surrounding a pot that's on a fire, mm-hmm. uh, which is actually a recreation of a shot from the National Geographic magazine. Ah... Oh, God. Oh, God. What is this show? You must become the ultimate Natty G photographer, Kevin. Only you can save us all. (laughs) So here we go. Here's the intense shit. When he comes back to the cabin, um, he finds that Dean has put a plastic bag over Patty's head. He is attempting to murder her. They brawl. Kevin saves her just in time. And then Dean, as I said, he, he storms off. And these two talk about October 14th. And it's a fucking killer, killer scene. Like, they even build to this climactic scene that, like, all the telltale signs is we're about to go to credits. And we'll talk about this in a minute, but I want to talk about all this stuff first. And then they go to silence and this scene with the two... He's sitting on the floor, she's still tied to the chair, and they just talk for, like, seven minutes or something like that and every, it's, a, it's a good long chunk of the episode yeah ev- every every word is amazing and i watched it again shortly before we started recording because i wanted to be really sure about things that i assert but fuck the gr because i think her entire philosophy is bullshit personally like she says all the gr do is think about the 14th she claims that kevin etc ignore it pretend it didn't happen want to forget all about it I don't think that's true at all. Like, as a, as a function of coping, you can't just think about a thing forever because you'd collapse under the weight of that. You learn to make a life where you don't think about it, but that's not the same as forgetting about it and pretending it didn't happen. I think everyone in this town and the world is painfully aware it happened. And she talks about how they strip away all of their, like, anything that's a distraction, 
any kind of feeling. They just, they're nothing but memories of this event that happened. And she says she doesn't want answers. She doesn't want feelings. She just, they just want to remember all of this. And it's like, I feel everyone is remembering this. And you taking away people's photos of their departed loved ones isn't going to help them, like, remember it more. If anything, obviously they're not going to forget them as soon as there's no photos around. But they're more likely to forget them if they have no reminders anywhere in their fucking house. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot to unpack here, so I don't know if we want to do it in sections. But yeah, I just, I found her entire rant about purpose and, like, why they're doing this to be complete bullshit. And I guess this is the info dump of exposition we're going to get about what the GR's beliefs are. And I've been saying every episode, fuck the GR, I think their ideas are bullshit. And I finally have this explanation, and I still think that, so... Their basic philosophy is kind of the difference between wallowing and grieving and moving on. So much it feels like they are just wallowing in this feeling. And, or they're not even wallowing in feeling, they're wallowing in the absence of feeling. Yeah. Is, is just, the weird part. They just want to be numb? Like, they just want to just be paralysed by this thing that... Like, kill yourself! Like, just do that! Which, I mean, she does. But <laughs> not because of that. It's just such fucking bullshit, because she says it's not going to be long now, again, implying something is coming, which you pair with the stuff with Wayne, and it's like, alright, and and something is clearly going to happen in the finale of of this season. You know, she's talking about something to live and die for, a reason to exist, but she's also saying that they've taken away all, like, feeling. All they do is dwell on this event, and it's like, that's not existing, that's not living. So I call bullshit, lady. The biggest bombshell, she admits that Gladys was killed by the GR. That, and she, you know, did you kill her? And she's like, she was fine with it. And I accidentally, because I restarted the disc to watch this, uh, this scene, and I saw the very beginning of the episode Gladys, and you get Gladys and Patty, like, nodding to each other. And now knowing where that ends up, it's like, oh, they're agreeing to what's gonna happen with her stoning to death but yeah but the thing is you also get like she begs them not to kill her at the end like she regrets it well yeah she just took like nine rocks to the face of course she regrets it everyone yeah, in the gr it's, it's... is a fucking hypocrite bullshit yeah. liar i know like <laughs> but, like it, she's not martyring in that way like they actually show the regret this isn't yeah. the suicide bomber hitting the button on their thing and then not having to think another thought ever again this yeah. is someone being subjected to one of the most brutal ways that anyone could die yeah. ever and, and realising halfway through like shit I, I don't want to die I oh, don't this want sucks. to <laughs> yeah. I, feel, I mean all of this tells me they're willing themselves into this philosophy and I think deep down most of them don't actually want it and they've just been sold a really good sales pitch and they're forcing themselves to do this, hoping something will click into place for them. But I think it's all bullshit. I think every one of them wants to talk and fucking live their life. But they are just making themselves commit to this... It's a cult. I'm sorry, but it is a cult. It, it's a cult. And it's also, in that weird way, it's a family. Because it yeah. doesn't have the baggage of their actual families. It doesn't have those emotional connections. And these are people who are going through the same thing. And you're all dealing with it in the same way and you're kind of stripping yourselves down to the barest aspects of what it needs to be a person but everyone is going through it and you will probably get more emotional like relief out of it if you actually just embrace being a fucking person you would and i don't i don't think the show ever implies that being in gr is is healthy I don't get. Um, I I want a reason as to like why I like being in the G or like why I've chosen this. Why is this like, a better solution? But there are cults in the world right now, and you talk to people afterwards, and they don't know why they're in it. Like you, <sighs> the Westboro Baptist Church, and all these these really fucked up organizations that just beat people round the head to kind yeah. of like agree with their positions, and they come out of it afterwards, and like they just don't understand. Like North Korean defectors and. I, I get why, like, the rank and files are in it. Like, I get that... I mean, we've, we've said it, how, like, they prey upon people they deem to be, like, vulnerable. And, like, I get how they can recruit. But the inner circle, the people like Patty, who... I mean, we don't know who founded it, but the way it's presented, she is the leader of this chapter, so that, to me, tells me she believes in it the most. But then she's also the one that breaks the rules the most, because she fucking talks all the time. <laughs> well, except for Meg, but... That's what I don't get. Why a person who 
is like smarter than them and seemingly stronger than them and like would would potentially have been the first person in the town to choose this lifestyle or whatever. It's like, why did you do it? Like, I get why you were able to bring in people once you had them, but yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I'll never know because Patty's dead now. But I know from accidentally watching five minutes of the next episode that we are going to get another scene out of Patty in the past. But yeah, it's it's something. Uh, she also, as part of this bombshell that you know they kill Gladys, she says she was okay with it, and when it's time, Laurie will be okay with it too. You know, that can't be pleasant for Kevin to hear, obviously. And also, as part of this whole, like, you know, we killed Gladys thing, she says it because now you will never forget her. And it's like, what is the point you're trying to make here that, like, by making it shocking, people will remember because you feel... There's there's literally nothing I could imagine that would be more shocking than 2% of the world vanishing without cause. And you think you're going to one-up that with rocks and stuff, like... I don't, I don't think I don't think that's what she's saying. I think what the aim is is that they, the guilty remnant, have tied them, tied themselves so much to this one event mm. that something horrific happening to one of their members makes you think by proxy of that horrific event. Like them, them sacrificing themselves, it forces them into the news and it forces you to think. So about they're getting attention by murdering their own people. <laughs> yeah, essentially. But they have attention. They bother everyone all the time. <laughs> it's, I mean, I, again, I don't think what they're doing is healthy. Okay. I don't think what they're doing is like well thought out or anything like that. But at I the just... end of the day, what they're doing is effective. And I think that's that's what the show really kind of like shows is that the Guilty Remnant I guess... are a constant presence in all these people's lives. And yes, you've got people like Nora who are dealing with it in adult and kind of responsible ways. Wow, well, she pays people got... to shoot her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a different thing entirely. That's a different kind of adult. Um, But, like, you've got Meg, who was driven to to joining them, and... I guess what I'm saying is I sort of, like, expect better of Patty, who I assumed was, like, a a person who, when she spoke, I would be like, you're a reasonable human. But I'm not... She may be the most insane of them all. Kevin deduces as part of this that she wants him to kill her, because she says, like, I'm not gonna... Just because you saved my life, I'm not... I'm still gonna rat on you. And it's like, you know, you you can't let me go, but you won't let me die. And, you know, it builds to this whole thing where she's like, do it, kill me. And she says this poem that made no fucking sense to me, but, you know, I hate poetry. Um, (laughs) So I don't know if you have anything more on it. But, yeah, he ultimately decides to let her go and says, I don't understand you. And, you know, I'm going to go tell everyone what happened. So she kills herself with a shard of glass instead. And she her dying words are, you do understand. And, she, you know, this whole understanding, she say, I want you to understand what's happening to me, what's happening to you. So it seems like she's invoking this same teased thing that Wayne has talked about, that Kevin Senior is talking about. Yeah, it's certainly intriguing. And, like, it's very clear they've got something planned, which we'll talk about in a minute. But Yeah, like, hell of a scene. They, are, they are building up to something. <laughs> yes. A hell of a scene with her taking her own life and stuff and I don't know if she's trying to make it look as though Kevin killed her or if she just wants to have died and either way but like, yeah, I, I don't know if our next episode is in, set in the present is going to open with Kevin having to explain I didn't kill this woman but yeah it's yeah. it's a powerful thing to end on yeah so the shot where kind of Kevin's holding her neck uh, mm. in the background there's two deer painted on the wall behind them ah. Uh, which is which is also, or they're kind of gazelle, but is also a picture, a cave painting taken directly from the National Ge- Geographic magazine. Shit, man. This is, is this all just Walt's comic book with the polar bears like, all over <laughs> again? So yeah, other stuff happening in this episode. Meg beats the shit out of Matt and screams again very much out loud because he's distributed his latest newsletter, which is about her mother. Laurie takes her inside and scolds her. She takes her over to Matt's house later. To, to make her apologise. She she briefly returns to her vow of silence, but she breaks it again later, and it's just like, oh, what's happening here? I like... Yeah, but um, we, do, we do also get from that the reveal that Meg's mum didn't get departured. Oh, I missed that. <laughs> you did, yeah. Uh, she died the day before October ah. 14th. And one of the reasons why Meg is so convinced by this is she got her she had her grief stolen. Oh, she doesn't get to grieve her dead mother because everyone you know, all these people vanished. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, I missed that. I, I don't 
they pay enough attention, apparently. I really like when they go over to apologise, Nora giving Laurie shit about Jill. It's like, yeah, go Nora, get in your passive-aggressive digs at Laurie. And Laurie slapping Meg for talking, basically. <laughs> She's like, fucking stop it, and like she keeps shushing her. Yeah, see, I, I really, really like this as kind of like a little piece of foreshadowing, is that kind of idea that Meg is really not happy with how they do things. No, I don't blame her, and yet I still hate her. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's the thing, is like, Laurie feels so, she's kind of like taking over for, um... Patty. Yeah, she's taking over for Patty, she's taking over that leadership role. I mean, and she Meg's... ends the episode sitting in Patty's chair for five days. <laughs> yeah, whereas Meg is like, why do we say quiet? Why aren't we going and punching people in the face? And... Yeah, I mean... All of, I mean, it seems so intrinsic to what they're about. The, the, the silence and the, and the white and the chain smoking and they're not taking an emotional stance. It's like, okay, I've never considered separating all of that from their core like belief system. And you've made some sort of like glib remarks about stuff that happens with Liv Tyler in, a, in later episodes. And it, it just, it's leading me to think she's basically going to try and do a mutiny and like break off and have her own sort of branch of the GR or something. So I'm willing to see where it goes, but at the moment Meg is just annoying because she sort of yeah she she disagrees with them, but then she also has signed up. She's the newest person to sign up, so she's you know she's the object of my hatred because she's a new recruit. And it's like no, why did you do this? But yeah, Laurie pays two men uh, using a bunch of money that Patty gave her at the beginning of the episode who deliver a trailer full of. I mean, they look like corpses. They look like corpses wrapped in, in, like, sheets. And they lay them out ceremonially on the church floor. And, as you know, as you said, Patty was earlier on laying out all these clothes, and it seems like they're pairing the bodies with the clothes and stuff. And it's all like, all right, you guys are about to do something fucked up, aren't you? You're going to have some sort of, like, yeah. parade of the departed or some shit. Yeah, it looks like they've ordered a shitload of those. Yeah, I was going to say, are these meant to be real corpses, or are these these, like life like realistic fake corpses or whatever um, i mean they did say that they can make it from anyone based on a photo indeed oh they stole all the photos oh fuck <laughs> oh. also i call bullshit on me able to do that a photo of someone's face would not help you make a full-on life whatever <laughs> yeah and like laurie sits in patty's chair as you know symbolically assuming control of this local chapter and uh, she's going through the files on Nora, and it says, she is single. And I'm like, ah, nah, bitch, no, she ain't. <laughs> so we're going to have to cut away and then come back, because it links up. So Amy admonishes Jill uh, for her, quite frankly, bitchy behaviour of late. Uh, and she states, some people are okay. And I was like, fucking preach, Amy. <laughs> like, go. She basically accuses her of stopping Kevin from being happy. Like, cock her father and stuff. Uh, and Jill asks, point blank, the question we've all been wondering. Uh, has she slept with her father? Uh, has Amy fucked Kevin? Uh, Amy, of course, facetiously says yes. And I love her phrasing that we did it on a big pile of guns. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's so Emily Emily Mead is so kind of wasted yeah. on this performance because she's so good. Yeah, you dropped a bombshell on me that this is the last appearance of Amy. I know. Oh man, what a wasted character! I was like, "Where's this all going?" Nowhere. I'm glad someone said some of the things she says, and the twins also are like, "What does it matter if she's got a gun?" Like, and I'm like, "By no means am I pro gun, but why the fuck are you giving this woman shit for having a gun?" And now why are you trying to find it now that you can't? And and, and and Amy's thing about, hey, some people are okay. It's like, yeah, fucking right they are. Yes, this is sad. But you have no right to tell other people how to cope with things. And if some people are able to move on, fucking let them. <laughs> I think I think a big issue with Jill, and this is this is my reading of it without her saying such, such something that loud, I think her big issue with Nora is that Nora lost three people. Mm -hmm. And seems in... kind of fine. <laughs> Yeah, and, that, and but Jill, Jill lost no one, and is super broken, and is super broken, and I think that's that's what makes. Yeah, she's jealous. Like, why are you like this and I'm like this? Yeah, yeah why, why, why do you make my dad happy and I don't? Why Teach is my me. mum mentor me? Yeah, why is my mum left? Why is yeah. why is my brother half a country away and yeah. not talking to me anymore? Like, why is my yeah. family more broken than your family who literally disappeared? Yeah. And I think it's it's that which makes me don't don't hate Jill because. At yeah. the end of the day, she's seven. She's seventeen years old, she and she's is. dealing with with these like kind of very fucked up emotions. She is 
for a matter of fact, a child of divorce, except the thing that caused the divorce is something that was entirely out of her control. And she, I mean, she doesn't even get that position of like blaming herself, or yeah. maybe she is blaming herself for why her mum left. Yeah. She's also got to deal with field hockey, which continues to be a brutal sport. Jill co opts the twins into breaking into Nora's house to look for the gun, which Jill finds in a board game box under one of the departed kids' beds. And she, yeah, she doesn't cope well with it. She cries and then doesn't put it back. <laughs> she, well, she just leaves it on the bed. Yeah, I mean, it gets again, it's that part of, like, she breaks down in tears because she kind of wants Nora to be all right. Yeah, she wants she her kinda, to not have the gun anymore, yeah. She wants this person who is broken for hope for her. That, yeah, I guess she's, like, pushing her to, like, see if this is real. Like, are you actually, like, okay? And then finding out she's not, she's like, I'm disappointed. Yeah, like, Jill, yeah. Jill is emotionally stunted and not able to talk about how she's feeling, but... Yeah. I understand every single step of her emotional journey in this episode, okay. which I, which I think is really fucking well played by Mark Paley. <sighs> You're talking me around on Jill. I'm upset. Yeah, they do a fucking terrible job of cleaning up after themselves. So Nora knows that someone was in her house, and I'm, she's a smart lady. I'm sure she knows it was Jill. But anyway, Amy moves out. Jill is very stoic about it, and Amy has walked out of all our lives forever now. She you has- want to see Emily Maid? She's a series regular on The Deuce, which I would recommend, okay. with or without James Franco. The Deuce. Yeah, Jill heads outside with a knife, sets the dog free. I'm saying Kevin won that bet. That dog didn't attack her, so... Kevin- that dog loved that meat. It did, and I'm saying Dean shouldn't shoot dogs anymore. Now he shouldn't. You know, not that he shouldn't have before. No, he, he uh, he's he's graduated to people now. Yeah, oh god. <laughs> this is true. Uh, yeah, and then Jill, Jill turns up at the GR house and asks if she can stay. And we get this intense eye contact between her and Laurie. And like that's where you assume the episode's going to end. And then, ha, surprise, suicide. Yeah, so that's, that's everything here. Another very good episode. Yeah, there's, there's just some, some great stuff happening all around here like yeah. i assume this one didn't work quite as well for you because the last one kind of had more of the the teases and the mm, i wouldn't say that because the mystery of like kevin shirts being in the woods and like him losing the time i'm interested in all of that as well it doesn't just have to be like the mystery of what's going on like i'm interested in what's happening to kevin and we get a lot of that and Patty's speech and like hearing her talk and he, if I hate someone I do want to give them a platform to stand there and explain why they are a fucking terrible person because then I can at least know I'm right in how I've judged them um, and she did do that and I still judge her so hey I thought it was a great one I, don't, I couldn't tell you which of these two I like more I like them both um, but yeah this show is is good show yeah like this this is I, I said this before like the show isn't firing at full cylinders yet hmm. I can um, I can see where it's like there's teasers of even crazier shit than this. <laughs> yeah, like this this is this is the show starting to figure out that they can do mm. weird things that kind of the the thing that the show has always nailed is the kind of pervading sense of tone. Um and it's had some really fucking good actors, but it's it's kind of struggled to find a reason for these characters to do things in interesting ways for an hour. Yeah. Yeah. And as as we can tell from like the fact that what we're at the point now where four of the best episodes of the series haven't had Tommy in them whatsoever. <laughs> wow, well, yeah. Like, like <laughs> the, the only episode that I would say that Tommy's been in that's been successful was Solace for Tired Feet because he is because he fucking stands up for himself and yeah. <laughs> he goes rogue. You drop in this juicy bombshell that like there are a lot of references to that issue of National Geographic. I think that's great and that's so Damon and Love. Uh, if I like went out and. I, acquired a pdf copy of this national geographic and read it all the way through would i get crazy spoilers because presumably you know what the internet's like when he put that that issue on the table i assume a large well not a large portion of the audience but some people watching the show did that like went through it all and were like trawling it for theories about what it all means i honestly can't remember okay i'm not going to do that i on, but... i honestly can't remember if the thing that they kind of imply ties into the magazine is actually in the magazine but the show does litter in in the first few seasons like imagery from the magazine well i like that as a regular feature going forward speaking of regular features it's time to update matt's character rankings based on likability bottom to top as usual or do you want to go top to bottom Let's let's go bottom to top bottom to top okay so displacing christine from the bottom spot is meg 
I've now decided I just fucking hate Meg. Everything I said a couple of minutes ago, because she's the newest member of the GR, she has the freshest hatred for me because it's like, oh, you were a normal person like 10 minutes ago and now you've joined these idiots. They were already part of it when I joined them. I know nothing else of them. I mean, but you also get the added fact of her reasoning for being so fucked up is just selfish. Yes, and she's also bad at being in the GR because she keeps yeah, like, fucking like talking. My, my mum died and everyone else in the world lost someone because 2% disappeared. So why aren't we sorry for me? Be sorry uh, for me. And like Matt, Matt is compassionate to her, but it's like Jesus Christ, fuck you. Like, yeah. and I also, you know, I don't want to judge people's acting ability because I'm not a good actor. I can dig out the old grades from my drama classes to prove it. But I don't think Liv Tyler is a brilliant actress, to be honest. I, I will say I think they figure out yeah. an avenue which she can do very well. Yeah, she's had her moments, obviously, but I think so far we're not getting good Liv Tyler, so... Uh, Number 13, Christine, the normal bottom bitch. Uh, I mean, she was sick, and she had the baby. Those are inoffensive things, but... Yeah, Meg really drew my eye this week, so she's she's displaced her. Dean, the dog murderer. The only reason he avoids the very bottom of the list is because he carries with him that air of mystery of who is this guy, and now we've had that extra thing of he hears the voices, so it's like... I enjoy your presence on the show because you have a tease of revealing things or some mystery, so I tolerate your shitty personality and hobbies. Jill has climbed up to number 11. Matt, I'm going to piss you off right now. What? That's, That's the last, the last appearance Dean. of Dean. That's the last appearance of Dean. <sighs> You're killing me with this shit. Fuck me. Okay. Um, <laughs> I almost don't want to go on. Uh, Jill has climbed up to number 11. I'm almost tempted to live edit it and put her higher based on some of the things you said about five minutes ago, but I find her behaviour less just openly upsetting and irrational now, uh, even if she can be a little bit unnecessarily bitchy. But, you know, your little spiel about how, you know, Nora lost everyone and doesn't seem completely destroyed by it, whereas Jill lost no one and is super broken. It's like, okay, that's the kind of character motivation I can get behind, but it's too late. She is at number 11 for this week. Maybe she will rise in future. Number 10, her brother, Tom, finally smashed that phone. Respect. Uh, I hope he does fully go rogue, but, you know, for now he is still involved, so he can't climb too high. Laurie at number 9, nothing really doing here, just... I really can't decide how I feel about Laurie because a lot of it is just, I like this actress, but it's like, as a person, I don't know about you. I think we don't, we don't, we don't know kind of where she's coming from because we get, we alternate between her being the head of the GR and then we also get these scenes of her going to go get the lighter back from her door together. And she's obviously conflicted, but it's kind of hard to tell. And it'll be interesting to see now that, now that Jill is with her, whether or not those maternal instincts kind of kick in more, yeah. Now that now that she has a family member around, mm. and like, with, is that more important? And with Patty out of the picture and Meg as sort, of, you know, she seems like she's now responsible even more than ever for wrangling Meg. It's like, well, you've got some opportunities to move up or down here. The twins at number eight. I mean, I'm just going to keep calling them true neutral because they're, <laughs> they're bad actors, but they also don't do anything outwardly terrible. So they're just they're going to forever just be in the middle of this list, no matter what they do. I think. Patty gets all the way up to number seven because that was a hell of a scene. And, you know, I still call bullshit on the GR, but, like, she's a great fucking actress. And, yeah, like, she's not she's not likeable, but Anne Dowd, she's earned yeah. her Emmy win for Handmaid's Tale. She is, as Bojack calls her, character actress Anne Dowd. The character actress Margot Martindale. It is, but they also look very similar, okay. which, becomes a, which becomes a joke in the show. Ah, okay, I'm not that far yet. I just finished season two of Bojack Horseman. Look out for a Bojack Horseman podcast coming after this. <gasps> Don't tease me, Matthew. Shit, we could do that. Anyway, um, <laughs> speaking of Matthews, number six, Matt, like, I mean, he's been higher on this list. I still maintain that at his core, this guy is kind of a prick. He kind of gaslights, he kind of is manipulative. And for every... I mean, it's funny when he brings out the religion and people tell him to fuck off, but I would also tell him to fuck off, so I can't put him too high up. The mayor has dropped. I had a ridiculously high up last week because she just didn't really do anything. She still hasn't really done anything. but She for, never does anything. Yeah, for, for whatever reason, I've dropped her down. Like, Yeah, I think out of annoyance, she's going to plummet all the way down as we go. Uh, Kevin, Jr., at number four. <laughs> I don't really know what I can say. Like, he's a flawed protagonist. 
great performance. I'm stunned Justin Theroux isn't a bigger star than he is, to be honest. His father, Kevin Senior, number three, what a fucking badass. And he has that mystery going about him, so more Kevin Senior, please. Uh, number two, Amy. Farewell, Amy, you've been great. Uh, you gave Jill some shit, and you said that you fucked Kevin on a big pile of guns, and that's great. <laughs> Uh, and number one, Nora. We might as well just assume Nora's at number one and the rest of the list is ranked after that because I don't see Nora... Maybe Nora does some super bad stuff, but so far she is just a pure sweet angel of light. Yeah, like, no, like I mean, Carrie Coon is... I, I can be pissed off that a lot of people in this show didn't win or were nominated for Emmys, but Carrie Coon remains the most annoying... <laughs> A mission. Yeah. A mission. Like, she got nominated for Fargo. I was going to say, did year. she get anything for Gloria Burgle? Cause she was nominated for Fargo that she's year. She's fucking great wasn't... in Fargo as well. I don't know if she's better, but she's fucking great in everything. Yeah. <laughs> it's my turn. Um, so shall we, shall we do a moment of silence for the characters who have died and the characters <sighs> who are leaving the show? Yeah. So, so we've lost now in this episode. I, I will say, the, this isn't a spoiler, they don't show up again. Like, don't go into the next two episodes expecting them to show up. So we've now lost... Dean, mm. Amy, mm. and the twins. <laughs> Come on! Oh my god, why even put some of these people in the show if this is how you're going to do them? All? So the, the teens were just hanging out to show us how fucked up teens are as a vehicle to get Jill in, back with her mother, basically. Pretty much. Oh, that's annoying. I mean, again, it's the show kind of realises these teens aren't really doing anything, and the more I interesting mean, stuff for Jill is with her family. That's fair, but Amy was fun. So. Amy was fun. I think Amy's the biggest casualty of of those four in particular. And Patty's and, dead. <laughs> uh, yeah, Patty's dead is the other big one. Uh, and Aud, so fucking good. It was like the fact that this is like her first proper scene with Kevin is. I'm glad they got to speak before. <laughs> yeah, all the death. She is. She is so good. I I said to you last night over text that I do think that. Kevin, like, Justin Threw and Aunt Dowd is probably my favourite combination across the entire show. Like, I, I just think these two have such an intense chemistry. Like, I've read interviews with Aunt Dowd, and the way she talks about Justin Through, it's like this kind of weird older sister kind of relationship where she's just like, oh, he's, he's lovely and he's wonderful. And yeah. we keep on having to shoot the scenes where, like, he calls me a cunt. And like, or like, I implied that he called me a cunt, and it's such a violent relationship between the two of them. But it feels like there's a lot of love between these two actors, yeah, uh, which is really nice. Like, as 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 you've realised, um, Patty is in the next episode, so we're not done with Andowd yet. But no, yeah, this is definitely the end of Patty in as the leader of the GR. Well, uh, yeah, I, I'm glad I get to finish watching what I started by accident. Uh, our next episodes, the first one will be uh, the Garthies at their best, which from what I could tell from those first five minutes it's just a flashback to before the event with just the people of that town then yeah like uh, every, every is... third every third episode is the off format one this is okay. off format yeah. but kind of on format if that makes sense yeah. like it's it's still structured like a regular episode yes and then we'll have the finale of season one and we'll get to see what the fuck the GR are doing and maybe we'll get some Wayne stuff who knows what we do know is this has been Countdown to Destruction Join us next time as we wrap up season one. Thank you, Ben, as always, for bringing your knowledge and expertise. I will see you next time. Yes, you will. Right, I won't see you, I'll hear you. I'm going to be living close to you now. That brings me joy in my heart. So, uh, <laughs> bye, everybody. I've got dreams, dreams to remember. I've got dreams.